super great and fun responses to both shows earlier today. And all one of you said I should keep doing the shirts. Uh, but I wasn't really taking an honest poll because I was going to do them anyway until winter. And you may remember last winter, you know, it's just too cold to do these short sleeve shirts. All right, let's see. Number one, we have to go to where Randy made an error. Now, I do make them from time to time. I can't keep all of these numbers and all these names and all this stuff in my head. I try to write it all down. <laughs> uh, but uh, in this particular case, I said that silver might have been near all-time highs, around 128 or 130, I think I might have said. Well, no, no, no. There shouldn't have been 100 in front of that. Around 30. Well, it's around 28 and change last time I looked, but we'll check on that later. Anyway, sorry for that error. Um, okay, as almost everybody that listens here knows, I have brought hundreds, maybe over a thousand products to market in my 50 plus years of professional life. I have been in a business as an importer almost that entire time since I was 23 years old, my first real job, I no, yeah, 23 years old, my first real professional job was importing padlocks from Germany for somebody that I was employed by. I did that for a few years before I went into business for myself. Um, while I was also a manufacturer for 29 of those years, I manufactured plastic products and also, but at the same time, I was also purchasing products from U.S. manufacturers but also from China, almost the day it became possible, from Taiwan, from Mexico, from Germany, from Spain, and from Israel. So with that background in mind, allow me to give you a very, and I've sold to, as you again know, I've sold to Target and Kmart and Toys R Us. Some of these names are, they're gone. They're out of business. Sears, I mean, you just go down the list, the U.S. Army. I've sold, you know, everybody. Ace Hardware. Uh, if you can think of the retailer, I've probably sold them grocery stores, drug stores, goes on and on. All right. So allow me to give just a quick primer on how tariffs impact various points along the supply chain. You're going to hear this argument forever, I guess now, that Trump's idea to increase tariffs is going in order to, and, and, and to eliminate income taxes as a result is going to destroy the world economy and raise prices and inflation will go crazy in the United States. I, and, and then on the other side of the coin, people are saying, oh, no, no, anyway, but I don't think 99% of them don't have a clue what they're talking about, okay? Now you'll know. You'll be able to have this argument sincerely. It's not hard. I think you'll be, I think you'll be able to remember everything I'm going to say. I don't think it's going to be hard, but let me know in the comments below if there's something you're still concerned about. Many elements, many elements go into the into how you determine the landed cost of an imported product. You're always, as a manufacturer or an importer, importers in the place of a manufacturer, as an importer, you are looking for your final landed cost, the cost that it is on the floor, ready to go, ready for you to ship out to your first level customer, You know whether that's a distributor, whether that's a retailer, whether that's an end user, whoever that happens to be. Okay, so what is your landed cost? So when you're an importer, you have the raw cost of the product that you're paying the manufacturer in whatever country it is. You have the packaging, and that might be in a completely different place. And you have to ship the product from one place to another to get a package. Then you have the transportation from wherever that's done to the dock. Then you've got the quality control, because in most countries, you're not going to trust your manufacturer 100% to do the quality control. So you have somebody there that does the quality control. And that's also sometimes associated with a broker that's handling it at the dock. Now it goes to the dock. You've got maybe dock charges. You've got loading on the container. A lot of times that's all included in the container cost, but you have the container cost. Whatever it's going to cost you from the time when it goes onto that ship or into that container and onto the ship to where it comes off at the other end and is sitting in the yard at the uh, at the other end in say Long Beach or, or in New York or down in New Orleans, a lot of different places that we brought them in from time to time. Okay. So then once you've got it there, now you've got to unload it. That might be a separate cost. You've got to bring it from the dock to your location, which might be local like mine was, or you might be in the middle of the country. You got to train it halfway across the country or whatever. On top of all of those costs, then you're subject to the gyre. You have the, the possibility of fluctuations in currency. 
and the possibility of fluctuations in tariffs or duties. They are no different than any of those other costs. They're all part of your landed cost, and they're all part of what you have to decide. Now, the truth is, no, don't let anybody tell you differently, you pay the tar tariffs in this country, okay? If you're an importer, the United States government gets written a check. This is how much you're paying for the tariffs or the duties over here. That is paid here. Goes to the U.S. government, okay? It's not paid by your Chinese guy or your 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 uh, Taiwan guy or you know whoever you're. No, they don't pay those tariffs or duties, but they're going to know what they are because that's going to be part of your negotiation. All right. Now, when you have your landed cost, now you have to go to market, and you're going to figure a whatever your standard multiple is. For me, for my as, as an importer, I usually figure five times from my landed cost to retail. Okay, you get, maybe you're going to sell it to a wholesaler. The wholesaler sells, sells it to the retailer. The retailer sells it to the consumer, or maybe you're selling it direct on on uh, on uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> yeah, what's it called anyway? Amazon. You're selling it direct on Amazon, but you're paying Amazon a cost. You're paying a freight cost because everything's free freight on Amazon. So you figure all those costs, and generally speaking. That's what I've found is on things that are under 20 bucks, under 30 bucks, you got to have a five times multiple. Whatever that multiple is, though, there's the number. Okay. Whatever your multiple is, that's how you do business. Okay. So now you look at that multiple and you say, okay, it's cost me $20 landed. I can sell it for 100 bucks. You go out and you decide, can I? <laughs> okay. Before you buy the first batch, can I sell it for $100? So you talk to your buyers, you check, you go into the stores and you see what other things are selling for. Can it, will it get a hundred bucks or not? Okay, well, yeah, okay. I think it'll get a hundred bucks. And so then you take your shot, you go out, you start to take orders. People tell you, nope, not going to get a hundred bucks. There's no way I can already buy this. Buy, oh, I got to lower my price. Or maybe, you know, you're kind of underselling here. You know, I think you can get more than that for it. But let's just assume that after all your negotiation, everything else you decide 100 bucks is the number just to make it easy on this ex example. So now you put it out there for $100. Now it doesn't matter what changes. So your manufacturer could say, look, my costs have gone up, my labor's gone up, whatever's gone up, I got to charge you more. And so it costs you five bucks more. It's $25 or it's $21, it's $22. Okay, your freight could be more inside that country. You, your, your container, they for years they cost seventeen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars for a forty footers from China to L.A. Right now they're like nine thousand dollars. Well, that makes a big difference, okay? Um, it could be that there's a higher cost of freight coming from the from the dock to your to your location. So many different things can change along the way, but one of those could be duties and tariffs. All right. Oh, and of course the cost of money, the variation of money between the two places. As those change, somebody's going to eat that difference. If you're paying in dollars, then maybe your manufacturer is the one that's getting screwed every time the dollar the dollar gets stronger, weaker. I can never. It's always I always have to figure it out. Okay, so but currency fluctuations we dealt with that way more than we dealt with tariffs and duties as a problem. All right, so let's say that the the tariff comes in and the tariff is ten percent. So now you're going to have to pay twenty two dollars for that item. Now you got to sell it for 110. Well, if you could have sold it for 110, you would have sold it for 110, <laughs> right? It didn't, nothing changed. I mean, you know, just because you bought it for 20 and you found out, you know, and your markup is normally five times and it's okay to be out at $100. If you're find out, if you, as you test the market, you find out, wow, I, I could really get 110 for it. You would have, there's no reason not to. So just because the tariff comes comes in doesn't mean you can get $110 for it now. Does that make sense? I hope that's the hard, that's the trickiest part. Okay. But it doesn't matter. It could be, and it happened last year after COVID. Right now, you've got high container costs. So importers are going, what do I do? Can I pass that along at retail? Probably not. Will my wholesaler own some of it? Maybe, maybe not. Do I have to eat some of the margin? Mm, I can't really do that. Should I just stop selling the product? Maybe. Should I outsource it to a different country? Maybe. Should I make it in the United States? Maybe. <laughs> that's why I bought my, that's why I built water bottles. That's why I extruded my own water bottles and bought caps from another manufacturer. 
when I made my bicycle water bottles because it was better and made more sense to make them in the United States. Not in China, not in Taiwan, not anywhere else. All right. So you can't just raise your price willy nilly. So no, the consumer isn't going to pay the, fine, the, the cost of the tariff. The price of the product is still going to be the most that the market will bear. A hundred bucks is a hundred bucks. All right. Typically, what happens, quite frankly, is the manufacturer is the one that has to eat it if they want to stay in business. They have to find a way to make it less expensively. They have to find a way to cut their overhead. They have to do something because they want to keep the business. So almost all the time, it goes down to the manufacturer. Now, there's sometimes there'll be a negotiation along the entire supply chain. Everybody wants to keep the business. So maybe I give up a nickel and the freight guy gives up a nickel and the container guy gives up a dime. You know. So you can go all the way up and down the chain and maybe you can find a nickel and a dime, et cetera, here and there to make up the $2. But at the end of the day, it's not the consumer because the consumer has already told you what the market will bear. All right. So now <laughs> you can go out among your friends and when they're telling you, oh, yeah, Consumers, it's, uh, inflation will go crazy because of this idea. No, it's just not true. I hope that helps. Let me know in the comments below if you think I'm wrong. I've only done this for 55 years. Um, and uh, yeah, well, 54. 54 years since I started with ABUS, A-B-U-S, security locks made in Germany, ABUS locks made in Germany, um, importing from Germany and dealing with Mostly currency fluctuations at that time, but we did have tariffs and duties as well. All right. What's coming up this week? Well, the two biggest things impacting the markets this week will be the Fed meeting, but that's all the way to Friday. So nobody's going to, that's in Jackson Hole. It's an all day conference of some kind. And there'll be things coming out of that uh, conference. The other thing is going to be the Democrat convention in Chicago. Now, there's two things that are potentially going to happen there. And one of those is the normal stuff. That would be new proposals, new direction, new things that they say they're going to do or not do. Um, you know, different kinds of people giving speeches. And, and, and a lot of that's going to make headlines. And we're going to be arguing about it all week. OK. And a lot of that could have an impact on the market. It, you know, it could easily have an impact on the market if it's going to be substantial to the economy. The other thing that could happen is there could be really, really big time riots. A lot of people are suggesting that that could happen. So if we have really big time riot, riots, that can also impact, you know, what's happening in the stock market, depending on just how bad it gets. All right. So that's the two biggest things for the week, because it's not a really big week. But there are things in addition to that that I think warrant your attention. Number one, Fed Governor Christopher Wal Walter, he has remarks on Monday. Then we have the U.S. leading economic indicators also on Monday. I'll get that to you tomorrow morning, first thing, when we have after the bell. Um, I am a big fan of the U.S. leading indi economic indicators because I'm old and these used to be important. <laughs> and there's certainly a lot of good stuff in there to learn, uh, but mostly people have paid way less attention to them recently. It was up 0.2% last month, and uh, it's supposed to be down. They're expecting it to be down 0.4% this month, and it's been down a lot over the last two years. All right, then on Tuesday, the Fed President Bostic, uh, will, he will be speaking, and also Michael Barr will be uh, speaking uh, on uh, Tuesday. So that's it on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we've got the minutes of the previous Fed's FOMC meeting. So we'll see. Sometimes there'll be some kind of something in those minutes that nobody was quite understanding. It's just something slightly different, and it will impact the market, sometimes a lot. Then Thursday, we have the normal initial jobless claims uh, happening, and they're expecting that to be up a tad at 230,000 from 227,000. That would still be a very low number, given that People like me think we're in a recession. But remember, a lot of times the labor numbers don't get really bad until the recession's well along. In my opinion, we're about seven weeks into the recession. So labor numbers could stay up for another few weeks. We've got S&P Flash U.S. Services PMI. That will be on Thursday, as well as manufacturing PMI. That's uh, 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 purchasing managers index. So the purchasing managers are letting us know what they think is coming. Now, last month, the services was uh, at 55, which is a good number, but the manufacturing was underwater at 49.6. And the pundits who are asked 
what they think is going to happen this month are giving us no answer. So we don't know what they think is going to happen. Then we have existing home sales also on Thursday. And last month, there was a 3.89 million. And this month, it is, uh, they're projecting 3.95 million, um, which would really dry up a lot of inventory uh, because they're not, nobody's building anything. So we'll see what happens with that. Friday, again, we have Fed uh, Chair Jerome Powell giving a speech at Jackson Hole. Um, and that is, like I say, probably the biggest deal that people will be paying attention to all week, in addition, of course, to the jobs numbers on Thursday. Um, you also, I'm sorry, you also have new home sales on Friday. Uh, that last month was 617. And they think that goes up as well. I guess were mortgages coming? To, no, no, mortgages hadn't come down yet. So they're saying going up to 625, which is still a really low number. We'll see what happens there. In terms of earnings, you got Lowe's. And of course, you know what I think about Lowe's. Home Depot is way more important, but Lowe's, they'll either uh, confirm what Home Depot said in terms of uh, the consumers putting their hands, holding their, their wallets uh, really tightly in their pockets. Um, and uh, Target also comes out. And of course, Target would be more along the lines of Walmart saying, well, yeah, we're doing okay because the consumers are going down market. You'll see what happens with those two reports. All right, what about the markets right now? Where are we sitting? All right, let's start with those bonds. As usual, we've got the 10-year up 1.7%. So it's actually up as we go in the pre-market right now. The two-year also up 1.9. That is now a 17 basis point split again. After being slightly reverted, it has now gone all the way back to a 17% split. Um, and we've got the two-month at 5.289 up 5 tenths of a one half of a basis point. All right. And then we go to oil, which was down when I looked earlier. Let's see if it still is. Yep. 33 cents. Um, 76.32 in Texas. And Brent is at 79.37 under that $80 figure. Natural gas down, coming back down again after really running up last week, but coming down strongly, down 0.89, almost a full percent here in the pre-market at $2.10 and a little change. Now we got gold up 670, sitting at 2544. Uh, as mentioned earlier today, that is an all time high, but somebody pointed out that it needs to get to 3000 before it will be an all time high, including inflation. So interesting to note. And silver now back up uh, to 29, up 0.61 in the pre market. Copper up also 0.19 at $4.15. The dollar down against the euro, but not very much, call it unchanged, but is up nicely against the yen at 0.22%, almost, well, yeah, 0.22, all right. Um, Bitcoin down 1,033 at 58,437. Um, made a run for that 60, but uh, not gonna get there. Then in the equities, we've got the Dow up 50, or 0.12. We've got S&P up 9, or 0.16. And the NASDAQ up 51.75, or 0.26. So what would that tell us, if anything, about tomorrow morning? Well, I guess it would tell us that there's a pretty good chance uh, that Tesla could be shooting for that 220 number again. According to the technical analysts, it needs to break through a hard resistance at 220 in order to move up beyond and into, let's say, the 270 range. Now, that's a couple of technical analysts that Wall Street particularly follows. I've seen other people with other numbers, but that is the ones that I've noticed recently. What do I think? I think that slowly but surely, between now and 1010, we will go to 265. I'm sticking with that. And it might go, it's going to go <laughs> up and down a lot in between now and then. Uh, for various you know pieces of news that come along. Right now, not a lot of news, as you can tell. Tesla itself, it's been very hard to find much news about the, the company itself the last few days. All right, so as mentioned, however, this morning shows, everybody seemed to really like them. So if you didn't see them yet, I mean, really, there's so much comment and everybody's basically, I think, having a very good time. Uh, so I'll put both of those up. I'll put a card for each of those up for this morning. Tomorrow morning, regular day, uh, Brian White at uh, the noon hour and uh, Larry Goldberg for the uh, the uh, the evening when we talk about the good news of the day. And then somewhere, probably Tuesday, Brian uh, Wong will be on 
because he's going to talk about X and XAI. You don't want to miss that. So what are you going to do? Hit like. Have you done that yet? Subscribe. Yeah, that's good. Good, good. Okay, got that? Okay, got subscribe. Now hit notify because then you'll, okay, you know what to do. All right, and then drop on down and, uh, you know, throw a couple of bucks my way down there in Patreon. It's been great talking to you. If I can find the button for getting out of here, what's going on? Here we go. <laughs>